So last time we, we talked a decent amount of, about loss aversion and we showed that one of the implications of loss aversion or one way to think about it is that rather than having one objective valuation of an item, you know, where we say I have a valuation of $100, I will pay up to $100 for that item. If I happen to own the item and the price is more than $100, I would sell that item. And that's what we typically assume is the case in economics. But we showed one example with the airline seats where when asked questions about willingness to pay and willingness to accept, it seems like people weren't behaving consistently as the traditional model would assume. And we said one way to think about loss aversion is that people would pay more to avoid a loss than they would to get a gain. But that's one way we can think about it. And all of these different formulations are just showing that people don't think about gains and losses symmetrically and that foregone gains are very different from losses and foregone losses are very different from gains. So we want to think about where these implications crop up in the world and where we see deviations from what we would expect that rational Spock economic man to do. So this is the second part of your discussion question that we talked about a little bit last time. We said we're thinking about the stock market. We want to have some baseline idea of you know, what rational behavior would look like. And then we want to compare that in specific ways to what we see people actually doing. So the last time I asked you what you would do first, and technically I still ask it first here, but this time I want to start the discussion with what the rational thing to do was here. That if we're saying, you know, I want to buy a car, I want to do something, so I have to pick some of my stocks to sell, what information would you base that decision of what to sell on if you were behaving like Spock? So I'm not asking what you specifically would do, I'm asking what you think Spock would do. Maybe look at like future like projected earnings. Yeah, expected future behavior. We can't know that for sure, obviously, but we can at least get some guesses. And that's the key, right? That the rational thing to do is to say, I am where I am today and I can't change that. Let's look at what we think is going to happen in the future to make our decision. So if we were if we had some projections of future values, how would you decide which of your stocks to sell? Those are the ones you would keep though, oh, right? Keep, yeah. Yeah, okay, just making sure. Yeah. You're like, I would sell the ones that people think are going to do awesome in the future. I'm like, no, honey, don't ever go into finance. But yeah, so those, you'd, you'd keep the ones the, with the best future projections and sell the ones with the worst future projections. Yeah. But that, you know, once we sit down and think about specifically what would be logical or rational, most of us hopefully got to a point similar to that, to say, oh, well, wait, the rational thing to do is to base this decision on what we expect to happen in the future. Okay. Then I asked, and this is why I asked what you would do personally first, because like we talked about last week, you sort of get primed by the questions that you're seeing. And if I ask you what's the rational thing to do and then say, what would you do? People are sort of disinclined to say, I would behave totally irrationally. So I asked them in this order to mitigate that sort of behavior. If we're categorizing these stocks as losers and winners, not on their expected future behavior like we were talking about, but based on our personal experience with these stocks. That obviously we have a point where we bought the stock and we have where that stock is at today. If it went up in value, to us that's a winner. If it went down in value, to us that's a loser. How many of you would sell the losers and hold the winners? Okay, a few. One, two, three, four, five, about, okay. 
How many of you would sell the winners and hold the losers? A little bit more than five, between I think counting about ten. How many of you would do something else? So a few of you are like, no, no, I'm going to be closer to this rational economic man, then neither one of these heuristics necessarily makes sense. Okay. So then we can ask, well, what do people in the world that are not you, that have not taken four years of economics, what do they do? Isn't the first option the rational one to do? To sell the losers and hold, why? Because you cut your losses. You don't want to, well, I personally, I don't, I know, like, for my stocks, I don't sell the losers because I don't want to say, oh, I lost money on this. But I know that you're supposed to sell the losers, kind of cut your losses, because otherwise you have something for years and years that does not make you money. What assumption are you, so, <clears throat> to get to that sort of conclusion, <clears throat> What assumption are you making about the relationship between past behavior and future behavior? Well, it's kind of an opportunity for us to keep stocks that's not making you that you're not making a return on. So you could just sell that, and with that new money, you can invest into something that could potentially give you a return. Because it's, it's an opportunity cost to keep something that you're losing money on. The the implicit assumption that you're making, and I'm pointing this out because it's really, really important to notice when you're making assumptions. The assumption that you're making, potentially without realizing it, is that those stocks that are doing poorly, or that have done poorly for you in the past, are going to continue to do poorly. So if you can actually conclude that the stocks that have done poorly for you will continue to do poorly, what you're saying is exactly correct. That why wouldn't you sell the things that you expect to do poorly and use that money to purchase things that you expect to do well? But again, the reason that that makes sense is because of those differences in future expectations. In the stock market overall, we cannot make the assumption that those stocks that have done poorly for us will continue to do poorly and vice versa. That's kind of the point, that we're seeing behavior that's at odds with the way the stock market actually works. So the conclusion I get from this is that some rational economic person probably wouldn't buy stocks. A rational economic person you have to make some sort would of most likely buy an index fund. I mean, you know? Yeah. So they probably wouldn't do it. Because sort of like the action is perceived by an assumption, and of course that assumption can't be verified. It's true. Most, most rational economic advice, if you were going to ask an economist, hey, I'm not a professional investor, I don't have time to you know, devote my life to looking at every you know, small detail about every company for my own projection, and stuff like that, what should I do? Their answer will be, go buy an index fund mm -hmm. and let it sit there. And that's slightly different from not investing in the first place. Mm -hmm. But in spirit, it seems to be in line with what you're saying, that yep. I can't guess. I know the stock market goes up generally. I don't want to lose out on that general return. Give me something diversified, and I'm going to call it a day. Mm -hmm. And when we come back and talk about behavioral finance, there's a little bit of a tension. Do we think that stock prices follow a random walk? Do we think that there's mean reverting behavior? And depending on the time frame analyzed and, def and depending on the particular subset of stocks analyzed, you get somewhat different behavior. But what we see is that it's really pretty difficult to predict future returns based on past returns. And if that's the case, and you rationally know that's the case, yeah, the best you can do is to throw up your hands and be like, well, I'll just do something. Because I know that it's hard to beat the market, but I can at least ride the wave of the fact that the market over time increases generally.